we're going to look at this idea of the most high rules ruling in the kings of men. We're going to look at where that phrase shows up in the Bible, what it's talking about, and then more importantly, what that has to do uh, for us as a believer, as a Bible student, as somebody trying to, to come to terms with uh, the world that we see around us. Right now, the hot topic is war, war of any kind, um, civil unrest or injustice in the world that you see around us. There's no shortage of things that you think, well, that doesn't seem right. I should really get involved. I think I could make a difference. And so with that, you see that urge to maybe promote your own interests or fight for something that you feel in your own heart is right. But yet scripture offers guidance good and excellent scriptural guidance for us so that we don't have to come up with our own ideas on how to maneuver our way through the life that we are in. So we're going to examine the context, if you flip to Daniel chapter 4. The reason we had Daniel 1 read was just to give us a little bit of context because we're going to refer back to that. We're going to examine that context of Daniel chapter 4, verse 32, where it says that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. Then we're going to establish the principle of strangers, pilgrims, and sojourners. Who is that? What does that mean? If you are a believer, if you call upon the name of God, if you are baptized into the saving name of Jesus Christ, then you ought to fall into that category of being strangers, pilgrim or pilgrims, and then sojourners. Then we're going to look at our relation to the state, the province, the country, the county, wherever you might be, what our relationship should be. And then also we're going to get some excellent instruction for a disciple of Christ, somebody who says that I am a follower of Christ, I put on the name of Christ. And the reason that we had Daniel chapter 1 read was because we're looking at a man who God was with, this man Daniel. In chapter 1 of Daniel, verses 3 to 6, we see that he is caught up in the captivity. He was with the children of Israel, but yet King of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, sweeps down and they are brought into this captivity. And in verse 7 and 8, we see that Babylon... They try to blend them in. They try to make these children of Israel, try to make them blend in. They're encouraged to ch change, change their names, feed them the, the king's food, blend into our Babylonian society. We don't want Israel. We don't want the children of Israel anymore. We want one society. We want you to blend in. But yet we look at this man, Daniel, and it says in verse 8 that he purposed in his heart. I'm going to look a little bit at what that means to, to be purposeful or uh, to purpose that intentional decision to abstain, to say, no, no, thank you. And we see that Daniel and his three friends were given knowledge and skill and the ability to interpret dreams. It wasn't Daniel's superhuman abilities to do this. Scripture tells us it was given to them by God. And yet we see this man and his three friends, they stand before the king. The scripture tells us that this, this is an honorable position. When it says that Daniel purposed this thing in his heart, we might say today that he was convinced in his own mind, or his mind was made up. The decision was made, and he was going to live with that decision. When he says he purposed in his heart, he had made up his mind. We get that same idea when we read the account of Ruth, where she's being asked to return. Our brother Lloyd led us in a study of Ruth. And this is the verse that you always think about when you talk about Ruth, where she says, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. And she goes through all this list of things. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. I'm going to obey your God. I will be buried with you. But down at the very end where it says, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left off speaking unto her. There was no convincing her otherwise. And so when we read about Daniel in verse 8 of chapter 1, how he purposed in his heart, steadfastly minded so that no matter what you said to him wasn't going to make a difference already had his mind made up so i want us to keep that idea in our minds that daniel already had that decision made up but when it came time to partake of the king's meat to be part of babylon mind was already made up it wasn't a it wasn't a decision for him we notice that they stand before the king with that god-given knowledge and wisdom proverbs 22 verse 29 tells us that see thou a man diligent in his business he shall stand before kings and shall not stand before mean men. Diligent or skillful. These men, they were not foolish. They were not dummies. They were diligent and skillful with this God-given wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 tells us, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. 
if this was the position they were in, they were going to do it. They were going to do it with all their might. But yet somehow, in their minds, they had made up that they were going to be purposed to God. They had made that steadfast decision to remain true to the God of Israel. And so as we build on this, we already see Nebuchadnezzar wanting to bring the children of Israel in, bring them and make them one. The second year, chapter 2, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has a terrifying dream. To him, it's a source of sleeplessness and anxiety. He calls for his problem solvers in before him in verse 2. In verse 3, I've had the dream, but I want the meaning behind it. His soothsayers, his magicians say, well, simply tell us the dream and we'll give you the answer. Nebuchadnezzar says, it's gone from me. I don't remember, but I still want you to figure it out. And he says, as the end result, this is the consequence. If you cannot come to the bottom of this, there is certain death. If you can't solve this problem that I won't tell you what I'm up against. However, if you solve it, there is great reward. And so we get a little bit of a, a look at the character of Nebuchadnezzar here. You can tell he's definitely stressed out. Daniel hears about this, obviously, because if the magicians and the soothsayers couldn't come to an answer, it meant trouble for all the king's men. Daniel, not afraid to confess, not afraid to come forward and say, this is the solution. In verse 20 of Daniel chapter 2, he says, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. doesn't say, this is me. Immediately tips his hand and says, Blessed be the name of God forever. And down in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. So this captive, this man brought in in the captivity, explaining to the king, there is a God in heaven. This is the deal. This is who is in charge. And he's showing you what is going to come to pass. And so Daniel is able to, with the help of our Heavenly Father, is able to show him the images or the image and the dream. And he says this image had a head of fine gold and goes through the, the entire image. That's an entire, be a study day in and of itself. And Daniel goes through and he tells him that you saw this stone that was cut out of the mountains. And how it destroyed that kingdom, that image. Verse 35, the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken in pieces together. And they became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So he gives, it, he gives him that interpretation. Now he tells him, this is where it comes home, Dan, or Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, art king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. Nebuchadnezzar, this isn't yours. This is given to you by God. Daniel lays it out for him in verse 38 and says, you're this head of gold. This is, this is you in this picture, in this dream that you had, where all nations at the end of it were wiped clean. This is you. And so I don't know about you, but if I was Nebuchadnezzar, I would start to think. I would start to come up with ideas. When will my kingdom be destroyed? Will I be the king of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar, that Will I be king when, when Babylon is taken off the map? Do I want that to be part of my legacy? How am I going to be remembered? You start thinking long term, as it were. How can I extend my reign? What can I do to make this image not come to pass? I have a captive here before me telling me, no, this is the way it is. There's a God in heaven who has given you this kingdom, but is going to take it away. How do I fight this? How do I, how do I stick handle my way out of this? How do I extend my reign? The answer is in chapter 3. This is how Nebuchadnezzar proposed he would do it. I will simply make an image that's all gold. I will make whatever's going on, I will make it fit my plan. There's no gold, there's no, no other metals in this. I'll make it up to my specifications. And I'll put it in a plane. That way no stone or anything like that anywhere around this dream. There's no way this dream can come true. That's how I'll do it. Man with his own strength. I'll, I, will, I will get myself out of this problem. And you know what? I'm not gonna, it's not going to be the, just me that agrees to this line of thinking. I'm going to make everybody do it. In verse 10 and 11, you are going to fall down and you are going to worship this golden image. Whoso falleth not down, that he should be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar has seen the image. Daniel has explained to him, this is his next step. Turn and do your own thing. The three friends of Daniel find themselves in a tricky situation, but yet we notice in their answer, 
a certain sense of confidence. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Much like Daniel purposed in his heart, Daniel's three friends are showing that exact same commitment to God. And so we see the king obviously displeased with the way that they react. Commands that the furnace be made seven times hotter so that it slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, didn't we cast three men into the midst of the fire? Lo, I see four men loose. And the fourth is like the son, the form is like the son of God. And it goes on to say that the fire had no power over them. And so at the end of Daniel chapter 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar says, I make a decree that anybody who speaks anything amiss against this God of, if you notice carefully, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not the God of heaven, not the God of Israel, but the God of these three friends. He says, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So he, he's beginning to see, he won't come full circle he won't come out and admit it is the God of heaven, but he's getting closer. Later on, Nebuchadnezzar says, is not this great Babylon, which I have built my power and my own majesty and all the word was yet in his mouth. Nebuchadnezzar hears these words, the kingdom is departed from thee. And this is where we see it. Chapter four, verse 32. This was the reasoning given. Until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. This is something Daniel understood in Daniel chapter 1. He knew when he showed up. And this is a point that Nebuchadnezzar struggled to understand. Until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Before this, before... Nebuchadnezzar was humiliated and made to live as an animal. He was warned in verse 27, Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, showing godlike characters. Then in verse 37, we see Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and extol the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his way is judgment, and those that walk in pride he's able to abase. That unwillingness to submit until he learned that the Most High would rule in the kingdoms of men and that he is able to humble them. And we see over in chapter 5, verse 21, Daniel is having the same talk again, this time with Belshazzar. And he's saying to him, speaking about Nebuchadnezzar, it says, but his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride. He was disposed from his kingly throne and he was driven from the sons of men. And he says, till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdoms of men, that he appointed the pointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou, O Belshazzar, his, hath not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Daniel is saying this lesson over again. You had the example of Nebuchadnezzar. You had this example before you, and you're struggling with that same idea of the Most High ruling in the kingdoms of men. You see two different ways of thinking. You see Daniel, who purposed to remain separate, and you see Nebuchadnezzar, and you see Belshazzar striving to make the most out of what this life has. And so we got a few lessons. I know it was fairly quick going through that. But we see a few lessons here. On one hand, we see Nebuchadnezzar, we see Belshazzar putting himself first and feeling like we can accomplish things within our own strength. We see that idea, we might not go out and build a everlasting monument. We might not put out a, uh, a golden statue or a golden image. But when it comes to making sure that our memory is preserved, that idea of, well, I don't want my good name what will people think of my good name in 20 years when I'm when I have perished? And so we see that idea of there's an ongoing struggle throughout generations for man to submit to the will of God. And yet we see, on the other hand, 
the example of Daniel. We see the example of his three friends who were indeed subject to the will of their heavenly father, purposed in their heart, already made their mind up, steadfastly minded, purposed in their hearts to remain separate because they knew that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. So that's when you see that phrase up there, our, our first slide of the most high rules in the kingdoms of men, that's a little bit of the, the teaching and the themes and the principles that come up with that. Daniel and his obedience, and Nebuchadnezzar with his stiff-necked unwillingness to, to submit. And so for us, if we call ourselves a follower of Christ, obedient to his word, a brother, a baptized brother or sister, then scripture tells us that we are to fall into this category here of being strangers, pilgrims, and sojourners. Stranger is one who is not in the place where his home is. You might think of other words might come when you think of a, a stranger, but no, this is, this is what we're talking about here. A pilgrim is one who travels in a foreign land seeking a new home. And a sojourner is one who resides as a temporary residence, resident. And so we find ourselves living within this world. And yet we await the establishment of a coming kingdom of God. We have to identify as one of these, not just one, but we fall into this group of being a stranger or a pilgrim or a sojourner, somebody who's looking for their home, for that coming kingdom of God. This idea of being a stranger, a pilgrim, and a sojourner is something that is, is built throughout Scripture. Abraham is described as being a stranger, a sojourner, someone who is looking for an inheritance. And in Exodus 6, verse 4, it's referred to as strangers and pilgrims. And then Hebrews 11, 8, verse 16, it describes Abraham's life as being a stranger and a pilgrim and a sojourner, somebody who's not content to live in the here and now, but yet look for that godly reward that is coming. We see that Joseph in Egypt, another faithful person before the king, before Pharaoh, stressing this idea of this principle of separation from the world. He says, God sent me before you in chapter 45, verses 7 to 8. And we see that it was custom that the Egyptians and the Israelites or the children of Israel had nothing to do with the Egyptians. And yet, Joseph, at his death, commands that his bones be taken up out of Egypt. He commanded, knowing that that promise was to happen, that Israel and Egypt, they weren't supposed to blend in. There was supposed to be no mixing together. There was supposed to be separation. We see Joseph, a man who stood in an honorable position, and yet was able to remain true and faithful to his heavenly father. He only bowed his knee to the Most High God. And so we see that the nation of Israel is even is described as strangers and pilgrims and sojourners. Sojourners with God in the land of Israel in Leviticus 25. Strangers and sojourners like their fathers in 1 Chronicles 29. And in Psalm 119, God commands, God's command offer guidance to the stranger in the earth. And Psalm 39, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears. For I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. This believer in God, this believer in Christ, not looking to make their life in the here and the now, but look for that coming kingdom age. And so, as a baptized brother or sister, those who are in Christ or um, within the household of faith, we too should then be called, or we are called, Strangers and pilgrims and sojourners. First Peter 1 verse 17 tells us that we are to pass our sojourning here with fear. There we are being called a sojourner, somebody who is here but not here, if that makes any sense. In First Peter 2 verse 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. Don't get mixed in with the different things that the world has to offer. And in Hebrews 13 verses 13 and 14, we are told that we seek that coming kingdom. That's our, our home that we are going to, that where we are going, that coming kingdom, of, coming kingdom of God. That is where our hope should be. And so then we are citizens, or we call ourselves citizens of a heavenly country and members of the household of God. 
Philippians 3 verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is with God and with that hope of Israel. That is who we are as a believer. That is who we tie ourselves to. Fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That is who our citizenship is to be tied right along with. In Revelation 21 verses 2 and 3, we see that God will dwell with man in that kingdom age. When sin and corruption is put away, then it will happen. But until then, we are exhorted and we are told to remain separate. And so we recognize then that the governments that are established, the powers that be, as it were, are established by our Heavenly Father. We can establish that principle by reading from Daniel chapter 4. God sets them up and God takes them down. And we are to obey those laws set up by them, except where they conflict with the laws of God. In Romans 13, we are told to render, therefore, all our dues. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we are told to make supplications and prayers and intercessions to the end that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We are not to be out there being troublemakers, people known with a, a bad reputation, but we are to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 1 Timothy chapter... Sorry, that's Titus. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 tells us to be obedient to authority figures. And in Matthew chapter 22, Christ tells us to render unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's and render unto God's, render unto God the things which be God's. And so all things in this world are for the sake of the elect and are under the control of, the Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Everything that we, everything that happens is under his control. Angels and authorities and powers are subject to Christ. And I know I'm moving quickly. If you'd like to see the slides or the verses afterwards, please come see me after I know I'm, I'm just looking at what time it is versus how much material I would like to try and get through. So we see this slide tells us that all things are under the power of Christ. So then as strangers, as pilgrims and as sojourners, we are constantly under the care of of our Heavenly Father. That is who we place our trust in. The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. If ye be followers of that which is good, who is he that will harm you? And we ought to say from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, that the Lord is our helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We put no hope, no faith, no trust in what man can offer to us. Our hope instead and our trust is put in that of our Heavenly Father. And so we see that the world around us is wicked, full of wickedness. Romans chapter 12 tells us that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, and not to be conformed to this world, not to blend in, not to take the king's wine, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have that battle won in your mind, so that when a situation comes along, you already know where you are going to fall on this issue. Have it purposed in your heart. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that we should glory in. The world around us is to mean nothing to us. Be in it, but not caught up, not entangled in it. And so... To apply the principle of being a stranger or a pilgrim or a sojourner, it means that we really have no place in the armed forces or in policing or in voting or taking part in jury duty. Because if we believe that the things of this world are directly opposed to our Heavenly Father, then we cannot put our, our, our hat in that ring, so to speak. We are told to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. If we were to call ourselves a son or daughter of God, then we have no business getting involved in the affairs of the world around us. It's simply not our place. We're, we can't throw our hat in two rings. War is of our Heavenly Father. It's a hot topic right now when, you, when talking about war. But yet war, in God's eyes, he uses the nations as his sword. 
We saw that when we flip back through Daniel, those first chapters there. We saw how God laid it out and said, this is my plan for the nations. They will come and they will go. The most high rules in the kingdoms of men. In the prophet Jeremiah, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground. The king of Babylon is my servant. He might have been the king of Babylon, but he was still servant. He was used by our heavenly father until the very time of his land come. Not a moment further on God's schedule when it was time, he was done. God also goes on to say that the nation that resists Babylon, them will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence until I consume them. God is using Babylon, in this case, to accomplish his will. God uses the nations like a sword. And here's a list of other places where God uses one nation to, to punish another or to accomplish his purpose. And then all of whom are punished by him. A righteous judge. Hunger's Bible Dictionary describes the religion of Canaan. Canaan was a, one of those nations that Israel would fight against. They were utterly immoral corrupt and dangerously contaminating and thoroughly justifying the divine divine command to destroy them that's why war happens that's why canaanites the canaanites were destroyed corrupting of the mind corrupting of that way of thinking that went directly opposed to that of our heavenly father israel went to war at the command of god to rid them of that and yet, we know Israel was not without, they weren't without excuse. For 900 years, they provoked God to anger by their wickedness. And they were given over to the sword by their enemies. It, it, was, it was punishment from God. And yet, God would deliver, deliver them. He would raise up judges onto them. Judges 2, verses 14 through 19. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hands that spoiled them. It was used as his punishment. So when we see war going on, it is God's hand at work within the nations. It says that God punishes sin with evil in the form of war or famine or pestilence. It is his hand at work. But yet he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We can't look at it and say, that must really put a smile upon our Heavenly Father's face. That is not the case. It is him working out his plan and his purpose with that. And so we call ourselves brothers or sisters in Christ. When Christ came, the law ended and his followers were commanded not to kill or to be involved in wars. John the Baptist and the soldiers, Cornelius with the Roman centurion, the Philippian jailer. We are told in Philippians 2 that we are to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. No longer fighting for our own self-interest or the promotion of what we think is right, but we are servants of Christ and servants to our Heavenly Father. Blameless and harmless. And yet when Christ returns, there will come time for executing of judgment. Psalm 149 tells us that the saints will sing joyfully and yet will hold the sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. The time will come, but it is not now. Our kingdom is not within the kingdoms of men. It is with the kingdom of God to execute judgment upon, to execute upon them the judgment written. And so there is, there will come a time for action, but now is not the time. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now is the time to call out that group of people that will come to him. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. There is that coming kingdom age that we hope for. That will be the time when we fight. Certainly not now, not for the kingdoms of men. And so we strive to live as Jesus who came to save men's lives and not to destroy them. Who left for us an example that we should follow in his steps. To behave in any other way would be inconsistent with what we are trying to accomplish. Instead, commit ourselves to him that judges righteously. So Christ refused to fight for himself. 
and commanded us so. To paraphrase when he says, um, he who has no sword of the spirit, let him part with his temporal things and acquire one so that he is prepared to strongly advocate and defend the gospel. He wasn't talking about going to war. He wasn't talking about fighting. Having your mind sharp, having that war within your mind already won is what Christ was talking about. He didn't advocate violence on behalf of avenging ourselves or, or for the greater good of mankind. We are told that our warfare is spiritual. It's in our minds. It's how Daniel was able to make that decision and say, I will not partake of what the king has to offer. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Yes, we might be here, but this is not where our kingdom is. Instead, we are to be opposed to every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. We wage that war in our minds right now. We decide whose camp we are going to be on. And yet we are told in Ephesians chapter 6, that if you were going to be a soldier of Christ, that there is armor to put on. You want to fight something, you fight something. The war in your mind. That war for your mind. And so the commands of our Lord and his apostles are specific to govern our actions. We are told not to take vengeance, not rendering evil for evil, not taking the sword, not killing, yes, the, the physical act. You're not supposed to do any of those things Follow in his steps, the example of Christ. Commanded to love our enemies, not just not fight with them, but bless them, pray for them. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. It's a completely different way of thinking than what we are encouraged to do in this world around us. To what end? Why, why do that? Why pray for them that use you? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. It is, it, it is for that reason, to be more Christ-like. These are the behaviors of Christ, praying for them that use you and despitefully use you. And you do this so that you can become more childlike, a child of our Heavenly Father. And so our way of life must be consistent with our claim for exemption. When we say, I will have no part of jury duty, or I will have no part of taking somebody to law, or I will have no part within the military, then we have to make sure that we are living consistently. We are told to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, but yet as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot say, well, I want to I be in this world, and we cannot say we hope for that world to come. You just, you, you can't. So therefore, if you were to hold a political office, or if you were to vote in an election, or if you were to go to law or take somebody to court, or jury duty, or any kind of military organization, anywhere where you say, I'm putting my hat in the ring with the kingdoms of men, you're going against the commandments of Christ. Turning the other cheek praying for those that despitefully use you, that idea of not putting yourself first or putting forth the promotion of your own interests, you walk contrary to the commandments of Christ. And so we must recognize the crucial, this is a, this is a quote from a book uh, from, I'll, I'll be able to find it afterwards, don't put me on the spot right now, but we must recognize the crucial importance of a consistent record of conduct. Should somebody come up to us and say, what gives? your behavior is inconsistent with your claim. If you were going to be called to the military, in prior drafts, it says that investigations were made into traffic violations, school, you the records at school, aggressive contact sports, attendance at meetings, interviews with friends, neighbors, and employers. Should the day come where you are called to military service or to, to uh, I believe it's called conscri conscription, there will be no stone unturned if they're trying to get to the bottom of it. We don't want to have a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? An inconsistency. Yeah, well, I saw brother so-and-so doing this. I don't see a reason why he couldn't serve in the military or anything along those lines. We need to recognize the importance of a consistent record. And so attempting to verify 
that all of their activities had been consistent with their claim for religious exemption. I can't go, but if they were to interview your neighbor, would they say, well, no, he, he never, he's never gone on Sundays or he's never gone on Wednesday nights or never gone to CYC on Friday nights. But I encourage you, if you ever get the chance, if you're ever in Ottawa to go to the um, war, war museum, definitely worth the tour. This book right here lays out the different categories for who would fall in under I'll show it. It's summarized in the next one. We'll get to that. Anyhow, they had the book on display. It's, it's worth, worth looking at. Conscription. It's where you're called to military service, but it's required by law. That means you, if you're going to have an excuse, conscientious, conscientious objection, you, you, you object based on um, your beliefs. And so on August 29th, 1917, after several months of intense public debate, the Military Service in Act was introduced. It introduced conscription and it was a div deeply divisive measure. This is just one of the, they have a whole bunch of signs in there. It's worth, it's worth taking the time to go through. But they break it down. It breaks down the different groups of people who would go. The military act shows the list. It breaks them up into six classes. Class one, if you were unmarried and childless between 20 and 34, you were first round pick as it were. You, you were the best of the best. Um, and then it would go on down the line. By war's end, 48,000 men had been sent overseas, and in all, 24,000 conscripted soldiers served in the front. 24,000 people commanded by law to partake, to get involved in those wars of men. And so they also had this picture there. Would you accept or reject this man's um, request to stay? So he's a teacher from Toronto, and he's, he's asking for exemption. And he says that as a school teacher, his work is of national importance. And yet it's deemed, they looked upon it and they said, it is absolutely necessary that competent teachers be held to their important post of teaching the young mind. Just to give you an example of, of things that, I won't call them excuses, but reasons that you, know, you weren't called in to be conscripted as it were. And yet they have posters telling you, be honest with yourself, be certain that your so-called reason is not a selfish excuse. Try seeing that and not having that weigh on your mind. Well, is, am, I, am I really doing it because I believe, or is it more just, you know what, I don't want to go over there and be slaughtered. Is it, so you see they, they had posters and uh, a campaign, an ad campaign, I'll call it, that would say, come be part of our war, come be willing. And just one more, the slacker must not rule Canada. And then bringing in children, daddy, what did you do, and do during the great war? There was that, that call where your kids would come to you and say in years to come, dad, what did you do? How, how did you help out the nation? Just tugging at those heartstrings as it were. And so we'll end off our thoughts for this evening with a quote from the book, or from, from Eureka. The one body of which Christ is the head is commanded by him not to avenge itself, not to take any other sword than the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the deity, the word of God. We are not to resist, not to resist evil, if smitten upon one cheek to turn the other. And it's a completely different way of thinking that we see in this world around us. Why wouldn't you stand up and fight? Why wouldn't you partake? War and desolation are no part of the Christian duty. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all. And this, faith, or this principle is faithfully and duly observed by all the Lord's servants in his absence, and will prevent them from avenging their own wrongs or lending themselves as instruments in the quarrels of others, be they individuals or nations. Not getting caught up, not being used by other people with their own quarrels. No degradation more ignominious means publicly shameful. No degradation more publicly shameful can befall a servant of the Lord than that of being a bloodshedder in the service of any of the sin powered sin powers of the unmeasured court. To be employed in such service is to be servant of the Lord's enemies. 
And so the saints cannot serve two masters. That's an idea that we've, we've touched on all through this evening. If they endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and fight the good fight of faith scripturally, they cannot be at the same time, or they cannot at the same time serve sin in the armies of God on earth. Their mission is to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, which protests against the wars, all wars and fightings of the Gentiles as emanating from their own unhallowed and unbridled lust. So we see that idea of being separate and that we cannot serve two masters. We simply cannot have a foot in both camps. We can't say that we are a servant of Christ and yet have an interest in the affairs of what is going on in the world around us. And so then in summary, as we bring our thoughts to a conclusion this evening, we are exhorted to be steadfast in our own minds. As soon as Daniel knew the situation he found himself in, he had already decided he was steadfastly minded. So for us as brothers and sisters in Christ, for people who love and obey God, we are told by the Bible to be steadfast in our minds. Recognize our Heavenly Father in our daily lives. Consistent, excuse me, consistently following him in all our ways, acknowledging him, not doing stuff, not doing the things that we would like to do, the promotion of our own self-interest, right? We can choose to become servants of sin, or we choose to become servants of Christ. And we touch briefly on the importance of consistency in our daily lives, because when it comes time, should, if it comes time, what our neighbors say, oh yeah, I know him. He believes in God. He's a, he, he is a, a faithful, and I'm not, I'm not saying attendance is everything, but he is a, he is a faithful attender. Or yeah, I see the way he behaves with his children, or I see the way that he conducts himself. Do we grasp onto that principle of being a stranger, a pilgrim, a sojourner, not hoping and putting all that we have into this life, or do we hope for that kingdom age to come? And we are reminded once again that we cannot serve two masters. And so when we started off, with the verse from Daniel chapter 4, where it says, that thou know, Until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. When we see the war, and we see the unrest, and we see the injustice in the world around us, it can be tough to say, Let's not try, why don't we try to make things better? Well, that is not what we are here for. We are here to be servants of God, servants of his, of his Son, and we await that coming kingdom. As, so, as strangers and as pilgrims and as soldiers. Thank you.